Hi, I'm Pete Stevens. I'm director of Mythic Beasts Limited, and we like automating things. That works. Cool. Um, I saw a job advert on LinkedIn. which said, I'm on the lookout for a junior network bod, bod to help with the data cleanse. Make sure our config, config management DB matches what's on the live network and correct any discrepancies. Imagine this is a three-month contract. Anyone interested, get in touch. And I thought, that's a brilliant opportunity. I'm getting to get in contact straight away. No, I didn't, actually. Um, that's an awful job. Um, that's someone who's got valuable skills of networking to do something really boring, boring, which is spend three months auditing config. It's potentially disruptive because when you dis your audit discovers a problem, you either need to fix your config system or fix the production network. Um, and it involves a whole load of archaeology. Why is production different to what our config management said it should be? Who put the change in? Why is it there? If I take it out, will everything break? So, um, and even more than that, is there's a bigger problem here, which is why is production different from what my config management said it should be? And how do I keep them in sync without in instituting a blanket rule, which is you can't make any change to production unless it's gone through config management, which means when you have an urgent problem, you have to wait for your development team to do a software release before you can fix it. And also, a three-month project, at the end of that three months, your network's probably drifted again, and you've got to go and do it again. Really, you should audit your network once a week, or once a day, or once an hour would be nice. So, um, we do have some code that um, almost, but not quite, completely audits our network. And when we started doing this, there's nice standard tools like diff. And uh, diff doesn't work, because IPv6 addresses can be written down in multiple different ways. So you might spit out one format from your config management, and when you ask your router what the config really is, you get a different format back, but they're really the same thing. Um, things get reordered. Um, so basically, the problem is two configs that are the same are not necessarily textually the same. And you also have the other problem that some things change continuously. So if you prefix filter other networks, which you should, um, the problem is for some of your bigger peers, you may discover that their prefix filter changes about every 90 seconds. And therefore, the running config in your router is obviously different to the one you've just generated because a change has happened. So um, for our network, we've got some configuration files that pretty much describe most of how the network is put together. Uh, YAML files, yet another markup language. It's like XML, but you can type it in yourself. Um, so we've got a file called routers, which knows about all of our routers. It knows about all the network addresses. And there's some extra data that says what type of network address this is. Is this an internet exchange? Is it a transit provider? Is it a customer? Um, another file, customers, which has a complete list of who all of our customers are that take BGP from us and um, exactly what they've asked for. Do they want a default route? Do they want a full routing table? And combine those two together. If you spot you've got a customer IP that sits in an IP address that's on the router, they can talk to each other over a direct link. Bingo, you can magically generate all of your uh, sessions that you need. Um, so that gets put together. Another file, static, for customers who've got statically routed um, routes um, who are transiting, and we can use this to generate yet more of our config. We have a file called peers, which for hysterical reasons um, is a tab separated file, which is not a format I recommend. That was a dumb idea. We still need to get rid of that one. And that could really do with going into a database and some more work needs to go so you can pre-populate your database directly from peering DB. That's something we haven't done yet. So um, uh, maybe one of our summer students might have a look at that. But basically from that, you can just run a command for a peer and it will build all of the config for every network exchange that they're on and build an up-to-date set of prefix filters that we've just grabbed and magic happens and that happens automatically. So all of our um, filter lists keep getting updated without anybody actually having to do anything, um, which is nice. Um, so yeah, um, we can generate all of our config and we have to write a context-aware diff that can go and look at a router, compare it to what our config management system spat out and it will um, canonicalize IP addresses, it will reorder things, um, it will check that our peers have a prefix list, but it won't specifically check the contents because we don't expect that to be the same. Um, and the result of this is we can now actually do an audit reasonably quickly. Um, so you can just say, audit that reader, and 30 seconds later it comes back and says, I found this line timers, why is it there? And then someone says, oh, that was because we had a problem on the internet exchange that we needed to fix with a longer timer for someone. Right, now we can go back and 
patch our config management in order to make that line appear later. Um, and now you can just keep going through this until your config diff says your test tool, your um, config management DB and your production routers are in sync and you know how your network works. And when you get to the point that you've got no errors, you can schedule this to happen every day. Um, and that means that you know they're still in sync and they're staying in sync. But the network's only one part of it. Um, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, so benefits of this. Um, we caught some nice typos. Um, it turns out um, V6 is rubbish because you can't read addresses easily by looking at them. And we typoed one of the addresses in the next hop, uh, sorry, in an update source, and um, meant that one of our sites didn't actually have V6 routing redundancy for several years um, because we didn't realize we'd put the wrong router update address in. That was a bit of a mistake. So, yeah, the result now is we've got a pretty good idea of what config we're running. And if someone goes and patches live, we know about it because our audit will tell us shortly. And you can do a, oh my God, the world is on fire. I need to just put this config in now to make everything stabilize and work and stop people shouting at me. And if you do that, the next day a ticket will get generated that says, why is this here? Can it go? Do we need to fix our config management system? Um, but it's not just networks. We do this lots. So uh, Thursday, uh, 10 o'clock in the morning, um, we got an email, ticket gets generated for us, which says, uh, we found a VM called Maryland, uh, and we don't know who's paying for it. Um, what's going on? And we do our entire VM estate every single day. So um, we know who is running every VM, except VDS Maryland, which we don't know who's running it. The nice thing about that is an hour later, someone says, having done a bit of investigation, anyone know anything about it? That's Richard. Alex, uh, who's called AVF on our IRC channel, says, oh yeah, I canceled that yesterday. Turns out Alex didn't do it properly. It got cleaned up. Our audit is now clean again. This is all good. Um, so yeah, that's where we, we go from. And we just kind of keep following the same philosophy. So um, you've all heard of infrastructure as code. Um, that's a picture of one of our racks that needs some more servers. Please send them. Um, and that is generated entirely um, from a script. So um, you can click on anything in that rack, and if you do it lights up red to say this is the thing you've clicked on, and then it gives you a bunch of detail about what that is. So that's Leprechaun at the top, which is a mythic beast, obviously. Um, and it tells you that network's got two, Leprechaun's got two network ports um, uh, on switch cam 8.2. Um, what VLANs they're on that they're currently up. It's got a power socket, which is turned on, which is always helpful. And it's got a whole bunch of serial connections, which isn't surprising because Leprechaun is the serial server for that rack. Um, so yeah, that all gets automatically created. Any hipsters in the room, please leave now. We use Perl. There is no Python. <laughs> so our config file format is Perl. It's actually just Perl source code. Um, and so as a result, um, uh, we call functions to build our assets database. So that calls the function add asset with a bunch of parameters, like how tall the IC device is, owner mythic beast, it's ours, it's not owned by a customer, where it is in the rack, what it's called. And then we've got a little for loop that adds all the serial ports to it, because no one can be bothered to type out 16 lines of, of adding stuff. Um, so this really is infrastructure as code. Um, and yeah, we've got lots of functions. And so for some of the things that happen, so that things that happen often, you just call functions. So that adds wires. So we've plugged it in and we've added its network connections. Um, and this means that because we've got a big pile of code that knows about every single piece of hardware and every single cable we have, um, we can audit this automatically. So we have compile time checks. When you say, I've put a device in the rack and plugged it in, commit it, it comes back and says, you can't do that. You've just plugged two network cables into the same network socket. That doesn't work. Um, so yeah, we can check, do our ports have multiple things connected? Do we know what things are connected to? Our asset tags actually embed a checksum, so if you typo an asset tag, it will refuse to go into the database. And um, does everything that have a connection, that needs a connection, have one? If you've plugged a device in and you've not added power, it needs to be a type of device that doesn't need power. Otherwise it will complain at you and say, you've plugged in a device that needs power, we don't know where it's plugged in. Um, and we also do some dynamic checks as well. So do things have DNS records? All of our switches, we can go and look up DNS, make sure we've got an IP address and make sure the thing is actually answering on the network. And then we can go and ask the switch which ports are up. Um, and yeah, it's autom all automated um, and you can just run checks. So you can run a check on a rack. When you finish working in a rack, you can just go check rack cam nine and it will go da 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 da, -da 
I don't know what's plugged into switch port 27 on this switch, but it's up. Go have a look. And usually it's your own laptop. Um, but, um, and so we can now do a full audit of our estate, which we do once a week. And then on a Monday morning, a bunch of tickets get generated, which say, I've just found something in this rack in this data center. I don't know what's going on. Go and do a manual inspection and fix, fix things. So um, in theory, and we're pretty close to this, um, certainly into you know three, four nines, if you unplugged everything we had and put it in a big pile, we could pick it up, pick it up and put it back again, and we know where everything would go. Um, so it's good. Yeah, so if you let kittens into your data center and they take your Ethernet cables out, we can tell you where to put them back, which is good. Um, but we also use this to feed other tools. So we have an MRTG setup, which graphs a bunch of stuff, and um, that just has a single script that builds all of the config for us because it goes and reads our assets database and then builds pages for power graphs for all of our power bars, summary for power for racks, graphs for switch ports, how much data goes out through IX, um, internet exchanges, through transit providers, customers, and that just gets built automatically. So someone goes and types some stuff into our assets database because we've plugged a new switch in, the MRTG pages to turn up sometime later. Um, if we add a router interface and plug it into a customer, a new graph appears in the customer's page and gets fed into the summary. Um, so it all links together. And from our asset tags, um, we can start from one of those and we can discover what is this device? Where is it plugged in? Where is the power? Where is the serial? What's its network address? How much bandwidth did it use? Um, and more importantly, our big picture of what the right look like looks like lights up red to tell you exactly where it is. Um, so that's all, all very helpful. And this feeds into our control panel. Um, billing is the other really important thing. Um, billing is, is very important. When we became a full-time operation in 2007, we discovered we hadn't billed one quarter of our customers ever. Um, because being a part-time operation, we kind of like taken servers off people, plugged them in, and said, oh, I'll do the billing in the morning, and then forgotten about it and just never charged them. So um, we realized that that's a really bad way to run a company. Um, so now, if you don't have a billing record, we try and make it so your service doesn't work. So you have to pay for it in order for it to work. Um, so, um, and it turns out we're not the only people. When we bought Blue Linux, they hadn't built a load of their customers. And when we bought Behosts, we found a bunch of VMs that they didn't know who owned them and what they were doing. So um, there's, yeah, whenever you look at an acquisition, it's really nice to get a copy of the billing database that you know, everyone in legal and everyone looks at to say this is what the company does. Compare that to what they actually do. They're often quite different. Um, so, um, yeah, we, we use billing as the kind of source of knowledge. So this turns into our control panel, which you can see here. Um, that's uh, an asset tag for one of our servers in Amsterdam. You can tell because the little location tells you where it is. It's got some IP addresses attached, um, one of which is a V6 address in the V4 block, which is obviously a bug that we need to fix. Um, and uh, you can click on the network settings, and it will tell you how to set your network up. Um, and uh, a little bit further down the page, you get the power cycle thing. So you can press a button, and it switches it off and on again. And recovery mode has also been generated for you. Because you've plugged a server in and we know the MAC address and we know its internet address, we've automatically built a PXE recovery boot environment. So if you tell it to boot off the network and hand it an SSH key, it'll boot into Debian off the network and you can log in and fix the computer you've just broken remotely. Um, of course, logging into a machine remotely is a lot easier if you have a serial console, which has also been automatically configured for you. Um, and so the customers can put their keys in and serial settings and so on, and all of our serial setup is built, and we log all the console output for you so you can see it there. So as a customer, late at night, your server crashed, you can log into our control panel. You've got a nice page which keeps a copy of what the kernel panic said, rather than having to phone someone up in a data center, get them to plug a screen in, and then copy it down by hand. Um, you can reboot the server, take it to the recover recovery mode to Linux, um, check all your file systems, sort out your boot setup, bring it back up again, and nobody has to phone me, which is the thing that's really nice. Um, but the other thing about this server that um, was um, I skipped over is there's a little thing called graphs at the bottom. That's because I added a billing record called management to this server, and so we automatically put a little graph box in, and our graphing service configured itself automatically, so all of our meaning graphs come through, so you can see disk I.O. and all sorts of things that are there. Um, it also sets up a whole bunch of monitoring um, because it spotted that this was a managed server and managed servers should be monitored. Um, every day, we port scan all of our managed servers to find out what ports are listening. And if we go and find a service that we didn't previously know about, we automatically set up a monitor for it. Um, because one of the things problems you have with a managed service is you say to someone, we've sold you a managed service, they tell you what they want it to do. 
sometime later they change it and they don't tell you, and then the thing they've changed fails and you don't notice because you weren't monitoring it, and they get really angry with you because they thought they were paying you to manage this stuff. So we automatically set monitors up for everything. Um, in this case, as you can notice, um, I, we can set monitors up when we're still in recovery mode before we've even provisioned the service, which is why our uptime is a bit low because we had to reboot several times. Um, but yeah, this automatically gets configured. In the case of the web monitor, um, that's a content monitor is looking for the words virtual server host. It turns out our monitor checkering process isn't smart enough at the moment to guess what the web pages should say. So instead, it emails our ticketing system and tells a staff member to look at this server and find out what the, man the monitor should be. Um, so yeah, we build Munin from a database, the HTTP recovery, our monitoring, all, or everything just gets generated. You just add a billing record and magic happens. Um, so how did we make this work? Paul. Paul is one of my co-founders, and he said, everything should be a REST. REST APIs with HTTPS are really good, and SSH commands are a pain in the neck because they always look like a hideous pile of orc, sed, and shell. Toby said, wrong. Everything should be an SSH force command because we use SSH everywhere. It already does authentication and encryption and solves all of those problems, and REST APIs mean that you've got to run a whole other service just for managing this machine remotely. Um, one argument happens, and the result is we do REST over SSH. <laughs> so you have a key that you put on your management system um, and then you can SSH into the server and then it gives you, you spit it some JSON and it gives you JSON back and then you don't have to worry about all that HTTPS key management and any of that stuff, it's all done by SSH which you already have because you can log into these things. Um, so this is an example from our Raspberry Pi cloud, you can SSH to it and you say slash unused and it replies with a bit of JSON that says there's three unused Pi's here. And then you can log into MyPy if you have the key, please don't do this, and say reboot, and it will turn itself off and on again. And it again replies you with some JSON, which in this case is a null message. It means it worked. It's a Unix tool. Um, the SSH file basically says, no matter what the user asks you to do, run the management command. And then an environment variable contains the command that the user actually asked for, which is what is equivalent to your get request in HTTPS land. Um, and that's basically how it's all stuck together. We wrote some standard libraries that do this, so it's very easy to just bring up a new API for talking to a server. Um, and you don't have conflicts like you want to manage a server that the customer wants to run HTTPS on, you're fighting over port 443 and stuff. Um, and SSH, FP, and DNSSEC almost, but not quite brilliantly solves the host key problem because when you spin up a server, um, it populates DNS with the host key that it's got, and so all of your discovery works badly because it's not very good. Um, we're hoping we'll get that sorted at some point, but it should be a bit cleaner than it is. So, um, we also manage updates for people. We've got thousands of managed customer servers that we need to do security patches to. They run a whole bunch of different operating systems. The customers get to configure themselves. So, um, we can't use Puppet or Chef or Ansible because the customers might want to run Puppet or Chef or Ansible or manage it themselves or do whatever. And we're kind of integrating with them. Cattle not pets is a brilliant idea for managing servers if they all do the same thing. Unfortunately, we run a cattery, a luxury cattery. Um, so when we see a critical update, we want to log into the server and update it by running apt-get install Apache 2.2 or Apache 2.4 or yum update HTTPD, and we've got to do this a thousand times. That's tedious and boring. Guess what I'm going to do? Um, we also don't have a single key to get into every customer service because that's a massive security risk. Every customer has their own key. So you also need to work out which key you need to use. And we also made it so that our staff can't access the private keys from our jump box. They can just request a session on a box, but they can't steal the actual keys. So no one can directly log into a customer server. You have to go through our gateway, gateway box. Um, and we restrict agent forwarding and things like that, so you can't hop from one box to another backwards and round. So we, we thought that through. So this is our management process. So you, you log into our gateway box and say, I want to do a bulk update. And it gives you a friendly message and says, just keep typing this command until the world is happy. Um, and so it, you run it the first time. The second time, you tell it what you want to update, in this case, Apache 2. Um, and then you get a bunch of options on the third run, um, which is what exactly do you want to update? So if you're doing a bulk update for general patches, we do one data center at a time. Some customers have setups with one split across two different sites. If we really reckon update and knock half of their servers offline, it's better if they're, we've taken out their primary but left the recovery system still running. You don't want to patch both at the same time. Um, in this case, I use the commands to restrict it to just one server. Um, because I didn't actually want to just bulk update a whole load of our customers simply for the purpose of getting some slides for a talk. 
Um, so I picked one of our servers, um, and it then goes and builds, works out exactly what packages it needs for every different operating system that we're supporting. In this case, I'm using the apt version of the command. Um, you notice you get an error for Wheezy, because Wheezy doesn't have security updates anymore. Probably don't use that if you can avoid it. And then it goes and searches all of our customers' servers and does an audit to work out who's got a vulnerable package installed, and it brings you back a list. Um, it then writes an email to send to the customer with some blanks that it will fill in for you. Um, and then it sends it to the customer automatically, so you've just done a notification. Um, if it's a non-critical update, that's two days. If it's a zero day, the world is on fire. Um, it's, uh, we are doing this now. This is going ahead straight away. Um, and then it sends all of the emails. And at that point, approaching step seven, you can actually now do your update. Um, so you tell it to run the updates, um, and it logs into every single server, runs the update, stores the output of the commands so you can go and look at them later, um, just in case the update doesn't work or something goes wrong or there's an issue. Um, and it also does some parallelism here, because um, we've got too many servers to update them one by one and finish in a reasonable time. Top tip, don't do all of your servers simultaneously, because many of your servers are virtual machines on the same physical hardware. And you can suddenly discover all kinds of really exciting performance issues if you try that. So um, this limits us to 40 servers at a time. And basically, it just rolls 40 active update processes as it walks through our server estate. Um, when it's finished, it does the really useful bit, which is it goes back and checks all of those servers to make sure they actually now have the new updated package and it's running. And this, if you do a full update, will usually bring back a server or two where, for some reason, the package update hasn't happened. Um, and then you can go and log in manually. Um, and then when you run it the final time, it says, congratulations, you've finished, and archives off everything it did, just in case we need to come and look at it later. Um, so how does this work in practice? Um, a zero-day update, so this is a, I found a security hole in SSH, or Apache has a magic command that gives away your private server key, that kind of thing. Um, we can do in about an hour, usually, a single package across every single um, server in our entire estate. Um, once a month, we do um, a bulk update for all the non-critical security things. And we do that data center at a time. Doing the entire data center takes about 90 minutes, which we do on a Thursday morning. Um, and yeah, we limit to 40 machines at a time um, in order to not accidentally clobber our network with too much load um, and overload the CPU or the AI subsystem or whatever. Um, so that's how we put it together. Um, handily, on March the 25th, someone generated everything I needed. Um, there was a security hole in S OpenSSH, um, which was, uh, in this case, patched for Debian Jesse, which was patched at a different time to the rest of Debian Ubuntu. Um, and uh, we looked at it and went, people really expect SSH to be secure. Whilst it's not an immediate remote code execution vulnerability, it's pretty nasty in the way it affects SCP. So we decided to do an immediate push. Um, and uh, it turned out we had 486 vulnerable servers. Um, out of the thousands of so we audited that we're running Debian Jesse with a vulnerable version, um, eight of them needed manual inspection afterwards um, because something didn't apply cleanly, which was mostly because um, the official MySQL repository um, has changed its key and apt was refusing to run because it didn't like a signature. Um, and yeah, um, 90 minutes later, we completed patching everything that needed to be done. Um, we did the same process uh, a few more times for different Ubuntu's and different Debian's when the different security teams rolled out the same versions of the patch. So, um, yeah, that's what we do. That's kind of scratching the surface. We've got a control panel that automates Nominet and OpenSRS, so you can buy domains and update who is details and DNS and so on. Um, it automates bind. Uh, we automated DNSSEC as well, um, because no one wants to know how that works. Um, uh, we automated hosting accounts. Um, our VM hosts are all KVM on Debian. That's all run in the same way. Um, containers, LXE on Debian. We're not using Docker because we want to keep our data. Um, and uh, we also have a daily reporting process that basically, if you are an experienced admin and you are handed a machine and you don't know anything about it and someone says, fix my server, there's a bunch of standard commands you type like netstat and IP tables and what is this server doing? What's the process list? We run that on every server every single day and log the output. So when someone reboots the server, we can go and find out what process it was running before it was switched off, which is really handy for those archaeology moments. But it's the same building blocks. SSH API, a bunch of Perl, bit of Python, a little bit of Go, a little bit of Haskell, bizarrely enough. 
Postgres, we like our data and we want to keep it. Um, we create packages for all of our own tools, so everything we build you can just install with apt and yum, and that means when we update one of our own packages, it automatically falls into the same package update process we use for all the other servers. Um, so that's all nice and straightforward. The process we do is work out how to do it once and write down what you did, turn it into a procedure so you try and do the same thing again, then you audit the ones you've done to make sure they really do all have the same config and things are done the same way. And then you start automating the process you're doing for setting these up until you've got just a handful of commands left and it's really quick and you can build it into the control panel and then you can just forget how all of this stuff works. Um, sometime later, in, for example, in the case of Let's Encrypt, you discover that you've got several thousand paying customers and you didn't notice, um, which is what we're kind of aiming to do. So if you'd like to know more, we have a blog that you can read. Um, we have a Twitter handle for those of you who use the, the, the Twitter. Um, and I also have an email address and you can email me. Um, and beyond that, does anyone have any questions? Oh, Neil. Oh dear. I think it's a really great talk. Um, one question about um, using the network as a master. Um, are you always sure that the network's got the best version of what the customer's service should be? Uh, sorry, the, the network is... So, in, in, so if I understood it right, you're kind of grabbing the kind of, if you like, the inventory of what you've prov provided to your customers from yeah. the network and then using that to populate all the other stuff that yeah. you've got in your systems. And that's fine as long as the network is accurate. Yeah, if it's not accurate, it doesn't work. Yeah, exactly. So how do you cope with that? Uh, you fix it. No, no, but how do you, <laughs> but, but how do you know that that's the case, though? Um, that's the reason for, so the, the, we make it really hard for our config to drift from production because things don't work if your config isn't in line with production and it means people fix things quickly. Um, so it, we're trying to make it as hard as possible to basically do an undocumented change that people forget about. Right, okay. Um, and the way, one of the ways to do that is to make sure that it breaks immediately if someone does that and, or or, or it comes up as in an audit report the following day or the following hour to say, here is an undocumented thing. It needs to be documented and fixed, and it needs to be done now. So you don't get that, oh, my God, we've got years of changes that no, we've forgotten about. Um, maybe, maybe, oh, yeah, okay. Maybe I'll give you a hypothetical. Imagine you've got customer Fred. Yeah. Fred's bought four things from you. Yeah. And you provision five, right, for whatever reason. Yeah. And then now you then take that fifth thing and you push that all into, into all of your systems, including the billing. So all of a sudden customer gets, and many of you have dealt with BT, you know how we do this. Um, ma many of you will get a bill, you then get a bill that's got five things on it because you've assumed that what went in at that point was always right. So it's, 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 it's a kind of comparison to here's what the customer ordered, inverted commas. Yeah to here's what we built on the network, to then here's what we then populate the rest of the system Right, on. so at that point the customer will get a bill for five items, yeah. and someone's gonna notice that it doesn't match the purchase order, okay. and complain. Okay, um, and at that point we've gotta go back and fix billing and production simultaneously to match what they ordered. Yeah, okay, I just, it's just, it was, so we, it, I've done kind of this network as a master, it's, it always feels like a, quite a, a, an elegant solution but it has downsides like that and that, you know, if customers move or churn or, you know, you, once was a customer came back and, and the records kind of get a bit out of... So um, for all of our VMs and things like that, we have automated cleanup. Right. So the customer cancels through the control panel and it just gets deleted and it goes away. And no one has to do anything manual. So that helps prevent drift happening. Yeah. Um, it's only when someone's gone outside the standard process that yeah. errors creep in and the aim is to catch those as quick as possible and um, call someone intelligent to go look at it to work out what happened cool. and how to fix it. Great talk, Pete, thanks. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Pete.